Trees play a very vital role in our ecosystem in many different ways. But one thing that I think might be the most important is the ability for trees to filter water. 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water and only 1% of that is available for humans to use. What are ways that you use water every day? I use water to water my gardens, to give my dog something to drink, and to make myself a nice cup of tea in the morning. But without clean water, none of these things would be possible. Trees play a vital role in keeping water clean. When it rains, water that doesn't soak into the ground turns into something called runoff. Runoff isn't just rainwater. As it moves downhill towards rivers and streams, it picks up things like nutrients such as nitrates and phosphates, toxics like heavy metals, pesticides, and other pollutants. These pollutants harm aquatic life and degrade ecosystems like the Susquehanna River and the Chesapeake Bay. But trees, just like this one, do a lot of work to help filter our water. Let's go explore how trees do this. Did you know that humans, we're made up of nearly 60% water, and trees, they're nearly 50% water. That's a lot of water for a tree, huh? In fact, a mature tree like the ones behind me, those trees can absorb nearly 11,000 gallons of water in a single growing season. Like I said, that's a lot of water. Trees absorb water through their hair-like roots that travel just below the surface of the soil and extend far beyond the trunk of a tree. After the trees absorb water, it releases it into the atmosphere via water vapor and oxygen in a process called evapotranspiration. Let's imagine a healthy forest after a heavy rainstorm, kind of like the one we had last night at my house. Well, 75% of that water will be absorbed back into the ground thanks to the help of trees. And the other 25%, that's released into the atmosphere via evapotranspiration. So you could say that trees play a tremendous role in the water cycle. Let's explore the other functions that roots play in filtering water. The roots of trees not only absorb water, but they also have another function. They create small open spaces in the soil called pores. The more porous the soil is, the more water filters through down into the water table. The water table provides water to rivers and streams, just like this one. People also get drinking water from the water table through the use of wells. Not only do trees take up water and help continue the water cycle, but they also prevent pollutants from entering waterways. Nutrients such as nitrates and phosphates are used by people to help plants grow, whether that's a farmer applying fertilizer to their cornfield or neighbors fertilizing their front lawn. Excess nitrates and phosphates in runoff are absorbed by trees, which also need these nutrients to grow. Nutrients absorbed by trees are nutrients that don't make their way into the water. Remember how trees increase permeability or how water soaks into the ground? Well, not only does this refill aquifers, but also provides an opportunity for soil to filter out toxics and sediment from the runoff as well. Trees also absorb some chemicals and heavy metals from runoff. Isn't that cool? Trees do a lot to help filter our water. Hey guys, I'm Ronnie Anderson. I work with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and I'm out here standing in the middle of what looks like a nice patch of woods. Uh, but if you see like through the trees, there's some houses. Uh, so it turns out this is just a little tiny patch of woods that's in my neighborhood. And I just wanted to bring you guys out here and show you uh, a little bit about trees. Um, and trees are pretty awesome. You've probably heard that before. You've heard a lot about how they produce oxygen for us to breathe. Uh, they can sequester carbon in their roots and in the soil. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some lesser known things about trees, specifically neighborhood trees or urban trees, because they get overlooked sometimes in favor of the majestic forests and things like that. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about right now, um, we're going to go through, I'm going to show you sort of how to identify some trees, like the more basic ways to identify trees. Turns out this is the hardest time of year to identify trees, because if we were out here two or three weeks ago, we'd be able to look at the buds, um, but the buds are actually turning into leaves, but they're not full leaves yet. So in two weeks, it'll be really easy, or two weeks ago, it was easy. Uh, so we're gonna do our best. I'm gonna walk you through a couple of trees that I know for sure. Uh, I am gonna cheat a little bit. I have a field guide and you can also use your phone to help identify. There's a couple of good apps, including iNaturalist. If you're like, hi, I just need to figure out what this is, you can take a picture and they'll help you, right?
Awesome. So I just wanted to talk about uh, a specific species of tree and how I know that this is uh, that species. Uh, so this is a young dogwood tree, uh, Cornus probably florida as the scientific name for it. Uh, and this is one of the few that I can get every single time. Tree ID is hard, especially without leaves. Uh, but if you guys take a look at where the, they're branching off, this is opposite so that there are two directly opposite each other. And that's true even all the way back. Sometimes they have lost, this, like one of the stems is broken off, one of the branches is broken off, but they always come out in this exact Y pattern, just like that, completely opposite. Um, and this guy also, those round balls, those will become those sort of white dogwood flowers that we recognize. And the bark of this tree is fairly distinctive. It looks a lot like alligator skin. Uh, and there are some uh, trees that have similar bark, but in combination with these other things, I know for sure that this is a dogwood. So this is another tree. Uh, and this one, I know for sure what it is as well. Um, and part of that is I have some background knowledge because this is my neighborhood. I walk around here a lot, so I get to see it through all the seasons. And I know when it has leaves on it, it's a lot easier to tell what it is. Um, but there are a couple of identifying characteristics. Uh, first of all, this is a sumac. I'm pretty sure this is a staghorn sumac. Uh, there's also smooth sumac that grows along here and they look very similar, except for these guys have um, fuzzy uh, stems to their leaves and even their leaf scars are fuzzy. Um, but we were talking about the dogwood having that opposite branching pattern. So every single leaf has a leaf exactly opposite of it. Um, this is the other kind of pattern or other leaf growth form. It's called alternate. Uh, so if you come, you can see there's a leaf scar here. There's a leaf scar here. There's not one anywhere opposite this one at the same uh, point. It, there's one here and one here, not one on the other side. So that's an alternate growth pattern rather than an opposite growth pattern. So this is another really cool tree. Um, this is called box elder or ash leaf maple. Um, and maples, this one it's really easy to see that maples are the opposite growth form. Uh, so if you come over, you can see the leaves are all coming out exactly opposite each other. There's one there, there's one there. The leaf scar is going entirely around the, the branch, which is unique to this kind of maple. Um, and it's called an ash leaf maple because when these leaves, these leaflets are fully developed, they'll look like an ash leaf, um, but they are in fact a maple because they have that, um, that uh, leaf scar that goes all the way around and they are opposite. So once the train rolls through, we're going to talk about what we think this, this tree is. I have a guess, and again, this is just going to be a guess. I'm not great at trees when they are not entirely leafed out. Um, but looking at this, there's a couple things I can tell. It's opposite, right? Because the two, the, the two leaves are emerging opposite each other on the branch. Um, and um, I'm just going to gently, whoop, very gently. Uh, sort of look at one of these leaves because I'm going to cheat. Uh, and I suspect that this is a maple leaf. Um, and when it's completely unfurled, it'll be a lot more obvious. Uh, you know, the, the typical Canada maple leaf, um, something like that, that will unfurl into a maple leaf. Uh, so I think this is, in fact, a red maple. So this is another tree that's really easy to tell what it is, even if it doesn't have leaves. Uh, the leaves are pretty distinctive, but the bark is even more distinctive in my mind. So uh, this is a sycamore. Um, and you can tell if you look, it sort of looks like camouflage on the bark. Um, and as it gets older, a lot of this will, uh, will peel off. You can see it's actually starting to peel away and the tree will look sort of white and so sometimes people call them skeleton trees or camouflage trees. Uh, so this one's really easy to tell by the bark. And they also have um, those, sometimes you'll find them with like a ball hanging off of it. It's almost like a dandelion. So these guys wind disperse seeds. So here's another tree. Uh, you might recognize it as some sort of pine tree. So bonus points if you did. Um, 
This is an evergreen tree, which means that it keeps its leaves throughout the entire year. Um, and some people don't really realize that pine needles are in fact its leaves. This is how these pines photosynthesize. And I know this is a white pine uh, because I'm looking at the bundles. This guy, it has five needles in one bundle. So if you can see that, there's this whole bundle right here. One, two, three, four, five. They're all coming from the same point on the stem. So that means that this is in fact a white pine. Uh, and these are a nice tree that you lots of times find in neighborhoods because they're pretty fast growing. So you'll sometimes find an avenue of them. They'll, they'll pop up really fast and they're really good to create like a privacy screen or um, a sound barrier or something like that. They're growing here on the edge of this pond um, and it's just nice habitat. Uh, you can hear some birds uh, hanging out up above me. Uh, it's got some nice shade going on. Did you know that you can learn a lot about the history of a tree and the history of the environment it grew up in just by looking at the tree's rings? This is called dendrochronology, or the study of the history through tree rings. Tree rings were first described in 300 BC by a Greek botanist named Theopharatus. Let's try and check out some tree rings to see what secrets they can tell us. Many of us are familiar with determining the age of a tree based on the number of rings. Horizontal cross sections cut through the trunk of a tree reveal growth rings. Growth rings are more noticeable in temperate climates with different seasons, like what we have here in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. During the growing season, or in the springtime, wood grows more quickly and the wood is less dense and is known as early growth or spring growth. The outer portion is called the late wood or summer wood, and this is what's grown during the summer and the autumn, when trees grow more slowly and the wood is more dense. This method of aging a tree isn't always exact. Sometimes periods of heavy rain, like what we experienced in 2018, or times of extended drought can change the appearance of tree rings. Tree rings aren't always perfect concentric circles. Sometimes there are little bits that give us clues into the personal history of a tree. Maybe there's a bullet from a past war or a nail where someone hung a sign. Sometimes trees even have dark scarring indicating forest fire, or perhaps there's a cavity in the tree that was home to an owl for several seasons. What special parts of a tree's life can you find in the rings? Climate science is another topic that tree rings can tell us more about. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is home to the International Tree Ring Database. This database has over 4,600 tree ring samples taken across six continents. Sorry, Antarctica, but you don't have any trees that we know about. One climate event that scientists have been able to confirm is called the Little Ice Age. This was a cooling period during the early 17th century. And if you remember your American history, that was about the time when European settlers began to settle North America. Tree ring data confirmed primary sources telling stories of food shortages, severe winters, and even currents in the Chesapeake Bay changing. That's crazy. I wonder what other things tree rings can tell us more about. Historians and archeologists both use trees to learn more about the subjects which they are studying. One way is through radiocarbon dating, which is the process of determining the age of an organic specimen by measuring the amount of radiocarbon particles present in the sample. But how do trees help with this process? Well, tree rings are used to calibrate the machines. There's actually a tree ring library with accumulating history of over 11,000 years. That's a ton of tree rings. Another interesting way that archeologists and historians use dendrochronology to learn more about the subjects they're studying is present at Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. There, archeologists use tree rings to determine the approximate date when cliff dwellings were constructed. Scientists also use dendrochronology to develop a theory about why the ancient Puebloans abandoned those cliff dwellings. The leading theory is that they were forced to leave the area due to a severe drought. What are questions about the Chesapeake Bay that could be answered using radiocarbon dating, dendrochronology, or tree rings?